I would like to call the school board meeting for Tuesday, January 21st for the Des Moines Public Schools to order. Please take the roll. Ms. Anderson? Here. Mr. Barron? Here. Ms. Bradley? Here. Ms. Caldwell Johnson? Here. Mr. Cody? Here. Ms. Delagardell? Here. Ms. Sawyer? Here. The first item of business is approval of the agenda. May I have a motion and a second to approve our agenda? Move approval. Second. We have a motion by Caldwell Johnson and a second by Bradley. Please vote. The next item on our agenda is approval of the minutes for January 7th, 2020. May I please have a motion and a second to approve the minutes? So moved. Second. We have a motion by Sawyer and a second by Caldwell Johnson. Please vote. Heather? Yes. The vote is approved 7-0, and I apologize, I missed the last vote on, a, on our approval of our agenda, but I think it was 6 one Okay, great. I forgot to call you, Heather, I'm sorry. All right, we have no district recognitions tonight. The next item on the agenda is the consent items. We allow any person or the opportunity to speak to the board for up to five minutes following the presentation of an agenda item. If anyone wishes to speak to an agenda item, please go to the information desk to sign up. Remarks must be germane to the agenda and we ask that you avoid references to personalities and character attacks as those types of comments serve no productive purpose. We appreciate your input. As a reminder to the board and public, the board will not engage in discussion or deliberation with a speaker regarding comments made to the an agenda item. Item. Discussion and deliberation will remain among board members at the board table with speaker's comments informing said discussion, deliberation, and determination as deemed nece necessary. Mr. Cody, do you have the motion? Amended action for each item on the consent agenda, including bills previously authorized, certified, and approved for payment by the board secretary in the amount of $3,705,822.11. Is there a second? Second. We have a motion by Mr. Cody and a second by Barron. Any discussion? Please vote. Yes. Thank you, Heather. The consent items are approved 7-0. Next, we have a public hearing. The public hearing will come to order. Is there anyone wishing to speak to item D1, public hearing for FCS and science upgrades at Hoover High School and science upgrades at Meredith Middle School? Hearing no one, I'll close the public hearing. We do have Assistant Superintendent Matt Smith um, in place of Superintendent Ahart. Assistant Superintendent, would you please introduce the matter? The superintendent recommends the board review the proposed plans and specifications prepared by Studio Melee for FCS and science room upgrades to Hoover High School and science room upgrades to Meredith Middle School, hold a public hearing, and approve the plans. May I please have a motion and a second to approve the public hearing and the superintendent's recommendation? So moved. Second. We have a motion by Caldwell Johnson and a second by Bradley. Any questions or discussion? Please vote. The vote is approved 7-0. Next, we have a public hearing. The public hearing will come to order. Is there anyone wishing to speak to item D2, public hearing for the Pottery Studio Project at Central Academy? Uh, Central Academy team, which I believe includes some students, the director, and some teachers. Good evening, I'm Dr. Gogarty. I'm the director of Central Academy, and I uh, wanted to say a few words as we uh, consider this proposal, um, or actually this project. When we first came up with the idea of utilizing space on level A, Bill Good said, if you can raise the money, we said, God bless you, man. And so we went to town and with the energy of Dara Green, our instructor, and our students who have just been um, wholehearted and our community, we've been able to raise the money um, through fundraising. The uh, WT and Edna M. Dahl grant has put up a lion's share of the, of the cost of this project. The rest has been raised through student activism and through individual donors, some of them tens of thousands of dollars. And some of those people are here tonight and they would just like to take a moment to say thank you so much for supporting us in this effort. Um, let's see, who we got first? Aaron, one of our students. 
Hi, everybody. My name is Erin Martin. Um, I'm a student at Roosevelt, and I also attend Central for some classes as well as pottery. Um, before taking throwing, I didn't really think I was that good at art. I'm not really good at drawing or painting, uh, really sketching, but it's allowed me to find my creativity in a new way um, by creating pots. And with the help of Miss Green, she's taught me a lot that I know, everything. Um, so it's really nice to have someone that cares so much about not only me growing as uh, an artist, but also as an individual. And I'm really excited. I won't be able to use the studio as a student next year because I'm graduating, but I'm really excited for what it can bring for future students. So thank you. John Busby from the community. Hi, thank you for your time. Uh, on behalf of the Renovate to Innovate board, uh, this is an exciting project, not just for Des Moines Public Schools, but for Central Academy and for the entire state of Iowa. This project is an amazing, innovative way to find space, to privately raise the funds, to create programming that really is unparalleled anywhere else in America, and to have it happen here is great. I want to greatly thank the Dahl Trust for their support, to our board, to the students, and very much uh, for the community because they become very engaged in this. And what can I say? Dara presented the idea to join the board for Renovate to Innovate. There was no way to say no to this project. Thank you for your time. And our instructor, Dara Green. You know, I talk in front of people all day, but yet I get so nervous, so I have a few notes. Um, good evening, board members. My name is Dara Green. I am the ceramic art educator at Central Academy, AKA the pottery teacher. On behalf of our former, present, and future pottery students, I would like to thank you all for your support in this teacher, student, and com community-driven project. Providing quality art education opportunities for students is crucial, crucial for the learning and developing essential skills to be successful. New board members, I would like to invite you to Central Academy to visit our site to visit the site of the new studio and to get to know the students that you serve. Again, thank you so much for your support. We're absolutely thrilled at this opportunity and we're so excited to begin. Um, Tilda Swanson Brown is one of our um, community supporters. She's been absolutely instrumental in helping us get our, our grants and, uh, and she's also put in some of her own money. I mean, quite a, quite a chunk of change from her and we really appreciate everybody and their contributions so we can expand more opportunities in the arts for more students from across Des Moines. So thank you. Hearing no more speakers, I will close the public hearing. Assistant Superintendent, would you please introduce the matter? The superintendent recommends the board review the proposed plans and specifications prepared by Slingshot Architecture for a pottery studio project at Central Academy hold a public hearing and approve the plans. May I please have a motion and a second to approve the public hearing and the superintendent's recommendation? Move approval. Second. We have a motion by Caldwell Johnson and a second by Mr. Barron. Any questions or discussion? I don't have any real discussion other than I remember when this project was introduced. I think it was a couple years ago, and so I'm really excited to get to see that next step. So, Can I just ask a quick question? Yeah. How much money was raised for this project? Do you know? $480,000. Thank you. All right, any further questions or discussion? All right, please vote. Yes. All right, the vote is approved 7-0. Next, we have a public hearing. The public hearing will come to order. Is there anyone wishing to speak to item D3, public hearing for fuel storage tank replacement at Prospect Support Facility? Hearing no one, I'll close the public hearing. Assistant Superintendent Smith, will you please introduce the matter? The superintendent recommends the board review the proposed plan specifications prepared by CEC Engineering for replacement fuel tanks at Prospect Support Facility. Hold a public hearing and approve the plans. May I please have a motion and a second to approve the public hearing and the superintendent's recommendation? So moved. Second. We have a motion by Sawyer and a second by Caldwell Johnson. Any questions or discussion? Yeah, this one's not quite as exciting. Please vote. Yes. 
All right, the vote is approved 7-0. The next item on our agenda is item E1, our monitoring report for Algebra 1, Part 1, Black Male Students. Um, I believe that we do have a presentation for this item. Thank you. How this works. Let me just oh, Tim. Tim's at the left. Okay. Here we go. Uh, good evening, board. Uh, in the fall of 2019, the school board established SMART goals and metrics for monitoring progress toward these goals. This report reflects baseline data for black male students in Algebra 1. Future reports will reflect progress toward the goal. So, tonight, presenting for us are Noel and Sarah in our Department for Teaching and Learning. Good evening. Um, I want to reorient us back to our goal to begin with. Um, uh, board goal number three is the percent of black male students earning a B or higher in Algebra 1 by the end of ninth grade will increase from 17% to 35% by August of 2023. And here are um, our yearly benchmarks we're looking at achieving um, as we keep on track um, toward this goal. Uh, just a quick note to think about this, not just as a high school or a ninth grade goal, um, but those students in, um, will, who will be freshmen in August 2023, those are our current sixth graders. Um, and so we're keeping that in mind as well and looking back all the way until kindergarten, knowing that algebra readiness starts in kindergarten and even earlier. But just to kind of put that into perspective about who we're talking about here. Um, we also wanted to take a moment to go back to why Algebra 1. Algebra 1 traditionally um, has been thought of as kind of the gateway course um, to students who are seeking uh, post-secondary opportunities in college. Uh, and that's just really thinking about seniors needing some pre-calculus pre to get into college and back mapping that to Algebra 1. Um, and so that means it's been taught in a way to do that, not necessarily um, in a way that helps us think about how we use algebra in our lives. And so we're uh, thinking and today and framing the goal around what happens for our students, all students um, in Algebra 1 and how that learning becomes applicable, not just to get into college, but for life. Um, and we've cited a study here, um, the Black Males and Algebra Project. Um, their research shows that it's not just about getting into college, but um, creating a positive math identity um, and how that can increase their ability and their um, approach to advocacy for themselves outside of the classroom. So in that mind, I'm gonna challenge the board also to take on a positive math identity, even if you didn't have a positive math experience as a student and start thinking of yourself or at least talking about yourself as a math person and we'll get you there. We wanted to unpack the goal a little bit. On the surface, our Algebra 1 goal looks pretty simple, grades. Um, but there's a lot in that and a lot that leads up to that final measure point. So uh, our, our final measurement is the average of semester 1 and semester 2 that's uh, on our students' transcripts. And uh, we're asking for a higher bar. Our, our prior KPIs were at a C. And we're looking um, at students who are getting a B or better, and that's important because that B represents a mastery of the majority of grade level standards. It's a better measurement of being prepared for the next step. Okay, so I'm going to, um, I know you've had hopefully an opportunity to check out uh, the dashboard and, and do a little um, study prior to the board meeting, but I am going to walk through a few of the data points uh, for discussion. So uh, first thinking about um, our black males make up about 9% uh, of our overall uh, student population. And so what we did was we broke it down um, by grade level. So looking at sixth grade, for example, of the 9% who are uh, black males, um, about 21% are English language learners, and about 29% uh, are receiving special education services. So um, the reason we included this data is, is we can see, obviously we know that um, students can fall in multiple demographic groups. They don't only fall in one, um, but we can also see um, there is an over-representation in special education, for example, um, when we look at um, 
how that how that breakdown happens. So you can see for sixth, seventh, eighth, and ninth um, what that makeup is. Keep in mind, um, a lot of times those students are being identified for additional services long before middle school or high school. A lot of that identification is happening early on in elementary, and so we continue to work um, in early intervention through our uh, tiered systems of support to prevent over-identification. So the first thing, um, as Sarah discussed a little bit about uh, the goal being be or higher, one of the thir first things that we've had to really tackle and take a hard look at is um, the number and the percent of students who are even getting access to Algebra One on time. And what we mean by on time is they are taking that course either early in eighth grade or on time in by ninth grade. Um, so when we look at that first um, part of that goal, uh, we want when we look at the enrollment, we see um, that a percentage of our students um, are not actually even enrolled on time. So they're taking other uh, math courses. I think the board even requested, if they're not in Algebra One, where are they? So we submitted that breakdown, and we can talk more specifically about that. Um, but really, that's that's our first that's our first line of work is making sure that we're breaking down those systems that are actually tracking kids in some cases to not even be on track for algebra by freshman year. So it's not just looking at the instruction that's happening um, within those classrooms, but it's it's saying what's happening starting in fifth, sixth grade that's putting some students on a trajectory to not even have access to grade level expectations. So that is not a small system to dismantle. Um, we can't just break it down and put kids in algebra if they haven't been equipped to be successful. Um, so that's really where the work is starting. Looking at um, the grades now, we can see how our uh, black males earning a B or higher in algebra one by the end of their ninth grade year um, compares to performance of all students. And keep in mind that the students who are in this data set obviously are the students who are taking the course. <laughs> so this doesn't account for the ones who are not accessing uh, that content yet. Um, the celebration is that we have seen um, a fairly significant increase over the past three years of about 12.2%. 12, 12 um, and I guess what this is telling us is that our teachers are doing a really good job of of teaching and holding kids accountable to the curriculum as it's currently written. Um, having said that, we're also noticing um, some gaps in our written curriculum that we'll address later on in the presentation. Uh, looking at this next um, set, this is uh, examining quarter grades. So we haven't traditionally, we don't have a trend line for quarter grades. We've typically only looked at semester grades. Um, so I guess some important context for this is that um, this is basically based on one unit of study. And so I guess our, our caution to ourselves and, and to the board is that we not overreact or over respond to a single data point, knowing that this is one quarter, and we won't really know if, we've, uh, if our, we're on track to achieve our goal until the end of the year, knowing that those grades are cumulative and, and can, can fluctuate rapidly depending on the unit. Um, the other consideration is that um, we are operating with a new curriculum. It's a much more rigorous curriculum um, in ninth grade in particular. Um, and we started off the year with a, a unit on statistics. That's not traditionally been part of our unit. It's a highly relevant topic for kids. We know that they need that, but it was new for both our students and our, our staff. So we were actually pleased. We expected a pretty, pretty dramatic decrease um, in student performance given those factors. And so um, we, were, we were pleased that, that it didn't uh, drop dramatically. We're looking at about a 2% um, less than looking at if we were to compare first quarter grades to last year's semester grades. So it's a little bit apples to oranges. Another data point that we continue to keep our eye on, even though the goal is not written around MAP, um, is we have MAP data that is aligned to our Common Core State Standards. And so we want to make sure that if our grades are improving, that 
our MAP scores are also improving. So for those of you who are new to the board, um, the MAP is, is a, a nationally normed assessment. It is online, it's adaptive. So what that means is as students um, take the assessment, it's personalized for the students. So if they get questions right, it gets harder. If they get questions wrong, it gets easier. And so it's just adapting as they go. Um, and then it tells us um, where that student falls. Um, we give it in grades two through eight, fall, winter, and spring. And then ninth grade, we give it both fall and spring. So the data that we've included in this presentation is, is looking at um, the percent of students who are on track for college and career readiness. And I actually um, have a definition for what we mean by college and career readiness, because I know there's a lot of variance in that. Um, according to MAP, what it means is that students graduate ready to succeed in college coursework without the need for remediation. We know that a lot of students will get into college once they're there, they're wasting a lot of money um, on courses that aren't actually yielding the credit they need. So this is, this is saying they're on track to not need remediation. Um, this particular data set looks at spring over time. So we have um, three years of data for 6th, 7th, 8th, and 9th, um, how they performed in the spring. So fairly flat, um, not a lot to celebrate in this uh, current data set. Looking at uh, this next data set, we're we're comparing the performance, spring performance, over the course of three years of African American males to all students. So I'll give you a chance to kind of consume uh, that information. There's a lot of numbers there. Again, when you kind of look at trends over time, um, a few increases, a few decreases, but overall pretty stagnant. Um, and one of the things that, that we were looking for in particular is are we closing gaps? And at this point, I think it's safe to say that we are not yet closing gaps. Here's kind of just the summary of looking at fall of 2016 as compared to those students in the fall of 2019, um, that trend over time. Um, Again, a slight decrease over that three-year period of time for our black males. We um, are working to transition the board and our public to a public display of our data. I'm, I know you're familiar with the dashboard. Um, one of the things I wanted to point out, and I'm not sure, yeah, I'm able to hover here, hopefully. Um, one of the things, maybe not, is if you hover over any of those uh, data points, you can actually get the N and the percentage. Here, Tim, I think, has it. He's going to pull it up for me. Whoops. This is touchy. <laughs> so you can see the various areas. And as, as Tim hovers over, you can see where the goal is. Um, you can see, yeah, here we go. Um, the number of students, so it, it really kind of um, gives you additional information that, that we didn't want to include in the dashboard because it would be overwhelming, but you can uh, access that by hovering over that percentage. So we're really trying to, um, A, be transparent with our data, B, have it accessible to the board and community at all times, um, and C, really see progress over time toward that goal. All right, in our response to data, um, we've been uh, digging deeply both into our own research on what's happening in our classrooms and what those outcomes are, but also national research because this is not a Des Moines Public Schools or an Iowa issue. This is a, an, an issue that schools nationally are grappling with. Um, and uh, some of the national research, including um, the opportunity myth, which um, was developed by the New Teacher Project, really points to four uh, ways to move the mark for students, not just in math, um, but that's how we're looking at, at it tonight. Um, high quality materials, strong instructional strategies, deep engagement, and high expectations. Not groundbreaking work, um, but where it is groundbreaking um, is that in our community problem solving um, process, those are the same things that our community, our students, our parents, our teachers, and our district staff have lifted up to. 
Um, these are the six root causes through um, a well-facilitated process that those sessions uh, have currently identified um, that students uh, have equity of high expectations that teachers and parents and they themselves believe that they can achieve high levels in math learning. Um, the purpose of math, we just, we started our, our night tonight talking about why Algebra 1 and how we've traditionally looked at Algebra 1 um, as a gateway to or a barrier to post-secondary opportunities rather than or in addition to how I can use this math to understand the world around me. Um, so the purpose of math and the sense of self-efficacy that students, they themselves, believe they can achieve. We've also lifted up from that group that student-teacher connections are critical, that if someone tells me that I can do it on a daily basis, um, that that may make an incredible difference for kids. We always know that resources and training for teachers are important, and, and it goes beyond just curriculum and instruction, which was also lifted up, but to those three things as well. How do we hold, how do we communicate high expectations for students? How do we set a sense of purpose and how do we create authentic connections? So it can't just be about the enacting of a scripted curriculum, but about the more, the whole package when it comes to math instruction. And as Noelle lifted up, um, the community problem solving also identified just access to the course and to grade level learning as a root cause. So it's nice to see um, that the national uh, research also supports what our community is lifting up, gives us a lot of confidence in where we go from here. These three that I've highlighted, the expectations, the purpose and self-efficacy, and the student-teacher connections, probably not surprisingly, are more difficult to verify, and that's what we're doing as part of that process. Not just pointing out all the things we believe we need to improve on, but then as we've narrowed them down, going into our classrooms and studying, and amongst ourselves studying, is this indeed the root cause, and do we have data, or can we collect data that verifies that this is a high impact lever? So those three things right now, because they're a little harder to verify, are um, deeper into the verification stage. Um, and we're using some, if you'll advance, thanks. Um, we're using our partnership with Iowa State um, University who we're connecting with, especially around um, Algebra One performance and, and using the tripod survey. And it asks both um, Algebra One teachers and students about their experience in that class. Not necessarily um, only about uh, what, what they're learning, but how they feel as they're learning it. Do they feel connected? Uh, can they ask questions in the class? Can they challenge each other? Um, we also know that part of that purpose and self-efficacy doesn't just come from the classroom, but that's incredibly important that our families know the purpose and how to create that self-efficacy in our students. And we have a tremendous opportunity that um, I'm excited to take advantage of this year. Um, we'll be partnering with um, Allison Vukovic and our community and schools coordinators to work with them on what they do best, which is connecting with families and bringing them into the, our schools for summer programming. Um, and they can really uh, be the experts about the logistics and all of that and how that can work to our advantage. And we'll provide training for those teachers, those community schools coordinators and curriculum so that we can kind of work in our uh, expertise field to create something better, which is not something we've um, tried before. And of course, uh, that access to the course has been lifted up. And these are things that um, were quick to, um, and easier to validate. And so we've been able to move forward more quickly on creating some responses through um, our task force, which is uh, really taking the recommendations of the community problem solving process, validating them where we can, and then creating action plans in response. Um, so one of those is, as we talked about earlier, appropriate course enrollment and pathways. Um, research tells us that if we put kids in courses that they're not ready for, and we are responsible for making them ready, but that they're not ready for right now, um, their chance of disengagement increases. So we need to make sure that students are, um, through systems, uh, enrolled in the appropriate course, and over time, as we build, uh, stronger instruction and use our curriculum to increase readiness that will increasingly become Algebra 1. 
And we also know that that just can't be enrollment into the course in Algebra 1, but um, looking at our equity of scheduling minutes in middle school, we'll continue to work on high quality programming, but we also want to make sure that every middle schooler has equity of access, even in terms of minutes, that they get uh, a chance to interact with that instruction. And the big one for us and the teaching and learning department, obviously, is curriculum and instruction and resources and training for teachers. Um, it became pretty clear last year as we audited our scales and we looked at why are grades um, so disparate from MAP scores. There's got to be something that we can um, examine in what we're asking teachers to do as they get better. Um, our MAP scores have stayed flat. And so we looked inward and we audited scales and observed classrooms for balanced instruction um, as called for by the Common Core State Standards, uh, which would be a balance of procedural learning, much of the way we likely learned math, um, conceptual learning and application. And we um, found that we were heavily focused on the procedural learning, which meant that when kids went to take the math assessment, which asked them to internalize those, that conceptual knowledge and then apply it in a new way, they were struggling to do so. Um, and so with that, we've adopted illustrative math. It's an Ed Reports uh, green light um, curriculum, which attends to the shifts in the core in a balanced way, but also is um, rated highly on usability for teachers. Um, we started full initial, in initial implementation in Algebra 1. Noelle spoke to that starting with a, st a statistics unit this year. Um, and we're also piloting in middle schools um, by self-selected classrooms. In sixth grade, we have five buildings participating in our initial pilot. In seventh grade, we have three buildings. And in eighth grade, we have four. And so we'll open it up for questions. Board members, questions? Mr. Cody? Uh, yeah. I don't even know where to start. I, I guess the first one would be, why, why wouldn't a student be starting on time? Why wouldn't they be enrolled on time? That's a great question. Um, it really starts with, are they identified potentially with a goal in math or in another area um, early in their um, education career? And uh, past practice has often meant that that student could have been removed from core content or given content outside of the regular classroom. And that um, we haven't seen with confidence um, students becoming getting back on track. And so when a student is removed from that core content, we often see them not making, making gains to keep up with grade level content. And so by the time they get to ninth grade, they are still not yet ready for ninth grade content and then are put in a course that might be, for instance, a two-year algebra course um, or, a math, or an algebra foundations course, but not the ninth grade algebra one course with those standards. And it sounded like you've done it, that that's something that's changing. Is that how I should understand that? Yeah. So, so what's the change look like? So one of the changes is to be sure that when students need extra support in any content, but math here tonight, um, that they receive their grade level content instruction along with the remediation or the scaffolding that they need. Um, and oftentimes it was one or the other, and so we know that in order to keep kids moving forward and progressing, they still need their grade level content and the supports not to go, and the supports to go along with it. And these kids get double days then, because that's a lot to pick up on when they're several grade levels behind. Mm -hmm. uh, not always double days, but keeping them in their math classroom and making sure that they have those scaffolding. And sometimes for students, there's an additional time outside of that course. But it's, it's also about during that grade level instruction, what scaffolds do, can be provided. And that's about giving teachers tools for supporting kids in that and sometimes co-teaching and other things like that. It really depends on, to your point, like how far um, discrepant they are and what it is, what skills that student needs because it isn't all math skills always that they need support on and, and sometimes we sort of throw the baby out with the bath water, right? And so if we can really um, work on pinpointing what skills students need and default to um, helping support them in the classroom as much as we can so that we don't remove them from core, we have a better chance of keeping them on track. Okay. 
Uh, somewhere in there we mentioned reframing it as, as algebra for life, I guess, is kind of the way I interpreted that instead mm -hmm. of just algebra for math. How, how does that look? What is that reframing? What form does that take? In my mind, it really means making sure we know why algebra is important and applicable in our daily lives. I'll give you an example. Um, Noelle mentioned that we started this year with a statistics unit. And one of the first tasks in that statistics unit is for students to develop some questions about their classmates and the demographic data in their, and to develop a demographic data set in their course, in their classroom, and then to analyze that using algebraic principles and thinking. Um, so putting algebra into context rather than a series potentially of formulas to be memorized and solved when given a set of problems um, is really the goal, is to put it in context and make it useful while not um, sort of watering down the content but trying to understand why this sort of thinking um, applies to their lives. So. <clears throat> So I, I don't know if you guys know this or not, but I taught math in the district for a long time, yeah. as well, until two years ago. Mm -hmm. And one thing that I noticed was when we adopted SRG, statistics was the unit that got left out because teachers wouldn't get there at the end of the year. Mm -hmm. It was the last unit in the book. There was a philosophical debate at our, at our uh, PLCs, you know, is it better to get to all the content or is it better to drill down on these backfill skills? Has that discussion, I mean, are we talking about fixing that? Because something's yeah. got to give. You're absolutely right. Um, and one of the ways that we've addressed that is through illustrative math curriculum, which makes sure uh, common core standards in math are broken down by what the major work of the standard is, and then there's some additional and supporting standards. Um, and rather than having to piece, like, piece through all of that and make that determination, we have a curriculum that's built to address all of the major standards and make sure that the additional standards are not necessarily taught as one-offs or after or we don't get to it because we're spending all this time here, but embedded in the work of the major standard. And you said only a few of the middle schools had adopted that? We're just starting with a pilot. Um, we wanted to really kind of get it in there and m make sure we also understand how it works and get some teacher feedback about the best way to install because this is for even especially math teachers and potentially a new way of thinking about math and reorganizing the way we've taught it before. And so um, we started by offering it up to some middle schools to kind of mutually support each other in what a full uh, rollout would look like. And so we anticipate for next year, all middle school classrooms will use this curriculum. And I guess when it said, you know, like four buildings or whatever, it's sixth grade, is that like one classroom in each building or all the sixth grade in that building? You got it, all, the PLC, mm -hmm, the, all the, the sixth grade. Okay. So then I guess I want to double back again to that, that algebra for life thing. Mm -hmm. I also spent a lot of years as an elementary ma teacher. I was a math coach in the district where I started. We don't have those anymore. Mm -hmm. One thing that I noticed was elementary teachers are almost to a person, not math teachers. How are we supporting them in making this math for life when they're not comfortable with math by and large? Yeah. Uh, I think we um, can see as we're working on that EL curriculum uh, that we've talked about in the past couple board meetings that as they're getting that curriculum under their belt and addressing early literacy, we're kind of coming from the other direction with our algebra goal, knowing that they're going to get that learning under their belt around literacy, um, but they'll get the same supports just as they have in around early literacy in math in K-5 in the coming years, um, knowing that we needed to kind of move through the system and not overwhelm folks. Um, but yeah, it's absolutely the next step in math learning. And part of that is developing those math, those teachers, to your point, as their own math identities and building some content knowledge. Um, because one of the questions that came up at community problem solving is how many teachers, even at the elementary level, are endorsed in math or have some formal math learning. And we're finding it's not very many, unsurprisingly. And so we know that we have some math uh, literacy to build in our teachers before we can build it in our students. And I guess in response, um, Kristen, you had submitted some questions around resources. And so one of the things we're looking at right now is how do we shift 
resources to get more expertise and, and support available. You, you referenced math coaches um, being something that we've had in the past. While we're not necessarily considering additional math coaches per se, we are thinking about how do we better utilize um, our AEA support system in a more targeted way. Are there positions that are currently vacated um, that we should recycle into getting more math specific content knowledge and support, knowing that that is an absolute gap that we recognize? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And also developing our leaders in their understanding of, of uh, effective math instruction, too. So when you say leaders, you mean like building principals, yeah. uh, instructional coaches? Instructional okay. coaches. Absolutely. Positions that already exist. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, <clears throat> I guess my last question then is, since we're, since we're an SRG district, why are we reporting on Bs? Hmm. So at the end of uh, the good question, the, at the end of the semester, our grades do um, get our our students' performance do get averaged into a letter grade for transcripting, um, and so it is kind of a, an overarching look. Um, as long as we understand what that B means. So if we um, know that B, um, if we have confidence that that B means a mastery of the majority of grade level standards, the B still holds as a measure that we can look at with um, some confidence that it's across the board. And so is that a, just the, like a one-to-one -one translation of a 2.5 or something? Or? It's, a, it's an average across topic scores. Mm -hmm. And so as these topics are articulated, students will receive you know, the one through four based on the scale. But then at some point, that's got to get averaged into a singular measure. And so that's where the grade comes in. So we do have the ability to break down by topic and see how our students are performing um, for each topic that makes up that grade. But for the purposes of goal setting and kind of big picture looks, we got to have a way to kind of reduce all of that information into a singular data point. So, well, yeah, so what, what is that average that makes it be then? What is that number? Um, the range is a 2 to a 2.9, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Average across topics. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think I'm good. This way. So a quick question I have is um, looking at the dashboard under progress, progress measure percent of black males scheduled in algebra one at the beginning of the ninth grade year or entering with a B or higher in algebra from eighth grade. It doesn't differentiate what the percentage is. I can't find it. If, if it's here, please let me know. But the difference between how many males are starting ninth grade having completed eighth grade with a B or better, or those that are just starting. Like, it's 71%, but then that doesn't really tell me anything. I can't differentiate between who those students are. So how can I get that number? Does that make sense? Tim, is there a way you can pull up the dashboard so that we can see where the question OK. So if you scroll up, it's um, right now it reads 71.2 percent. Um, you're on the access one, correct? Um, I, don't I don't know how know. to navigate this thing. <laughs> there we go. There you go. So the percent of black males earning a B or higher in Algebra 1 by the end of ninth grade. Or higher in Algebra 1 from eighth grade. So it looks like they could have started, mm -hmm. or they could have gotten a B or better in eighth grade. I have that right here. Yeah, some mm -hmm. of those kids. And then some of those kids would be starting mm -hmm. algebra one at the beginning of ninth grade. Yeah, correct. Right? Yeah. They don't take it twice. They don't take it in eighth correct. grade and ninth grade, right? So right. how do we differentiate, differentiate between those yeah, we've got two groups that. of students. Mm -hmm. It's not, um, that doesn't show up on our dashboard, um, but uh, last year, uh, there were 6.1% of those um, of those Bs or higher were students who had um, uh, a B or higher in middle school. Okay. So 6.1%, so then the remainder would be those starting? Yep, 17.8% with the B or higher um, at the end of their ninth grade year. 
Okay, yeah. I'm just confused on that number. So Sorry. of the 70, whatever, six, yeah, it would be 0.2%. Well, that's the yes. 1920 year. Yeah, looking at 1920, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. That's looking at actual data. So it would be about 65% of students of, of yeah, because you'd have to. And if that's some feedback from the board, we can delineate that out on the dashboard. So you're saying about 65% of students are starting algebra in ninth grade year, and the remainder would be those who finished eighth grade with a B or better? Mm -hmm. the, the, yeah, the other 6% to okay. get to the 71. So that would be helpful to know what those, the difference between those numbers? Sure. Thank you. Could that, could that just be in the information that when you hover over it, you can see? Right. So there's... You know, there's 226 total students, 161 were, were captured there. So then it's... It's not cluttered. It's just the number, the, the breakout of the 161, I think is what you're looking for, right? Mm -hmm. Make that happen. <laughs> <laughs> she can make anything happen. Ms. Sawyer, did you have other additional... Okay. Ms. Caldwell Johnson. <clears throat> Just a couple. So um, we already talked about what, what and why the use of the B, so I get that. But I guess my question really around the B goes to fidelity of SRG mm -hmm. and how we ensure that a B at East is a B at Lincoln, yep. or same at the middle school level. So what's our measure for testing right. the fidelity of that B? Mm -hmm. uh, it's actually a critical piece of why we bring teachers across the city together um, over the course of the year on an, a really decent frequency in two ways. Um, one, we have um, PLC leaders. Um, those are teacher leaders who really develop kind of their colleagues um, and we bring those folks together once a month and a, a significant part of that learning is calibration on student evidence on what we look at student evidence looking at our scales that delineate the quality of learning and the level of learning and calibrating as a team on that so they can bring that back to their schools and they also come together as an entire PLC for instance all algebra one teachers um, a number of times of year to do that work and so it's an ongoing calibration and it's never really done. Um, and that really makes up the bulk of those conversations. What do the standards ask our students to do? How do we know we've done that? What does that evidence look like? And how do we as a set of educators agree on how to provide student feedback, sometimes in the form of grades, but most effectively in the form of other kinds of feedbacks in the midst of that. So we're doing sort of also wellness checks rather than autopsies so that, and one of the reasons why quarter grades is a, li a little hard to know what's coming next mm -hmm. um, because there's opportunities then when we catch students who need support and to provide feedback um, that that's standards based and related to then the end goal. So and I would I would just add that uh, moving forward I think the heavier lift is certainly we've been working to calibrate across buildings to your point um, but if we're all calibrated around the same low expectations we're not going to get anywhere so mm -hmm. so the next phase of the work is calibrating around an external bar, which MAP can provide for us, um, as well as, as further study around what the Common Core actually demands of students. Um, because there is a danger, not that this happens frequently, but it does happen that, that you could have four teachers all agreeing on student evidence, but if the evidence doesn't meet the national standard, therein lies the problem. So it's, it's actually a two-pronged approach mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that we have to take, yeah. Okay. And then I just have uh, two other quick questions. So I'm going to go back to, <clears throat> let me see, which slide is it? The one that has the breakdown of students 6th, 7th, 8th, and 9th mm -hmm. with the additional information around English language learners and special ed. So if you look at that um, <clears throat> and you look at each of the grade levels, am I to assume that when we say all, we mean all, and even though we're showing 48% English language learners and 67%, I mean, 60, 21% English language learners and 29% in sixth grade, those students are also going to be considered 
in the number that we report on mm -hmm. when we report all black males. Okay, mm -hmm. so um, when you look at the universe, the universe is pretty small out when you take out those numbers. Um, but for me, I'm gonna now take you to the other slide, which was, can't find it now, the board goal, mm -hmm. which sets out sort of our predicted pace of moving to the goal. Mm -hmm. That's huge. And I know it's a stretch, but I guess my question is, at this point, we're already two points down from previous year. We're projecting in August of this year to be at 21%. What are you gonna do to get there? What does it look like? Help us understand how we create the right framework instructionally to get kids there without doing something that isn't even feasible. Mm -hmm. I mean, I feel like the interventions are gonna have to be even beyond robust and significant. <coughs> Um, because we're talking about a group of kids in a lot of instances that may already be underperforming in math. Mm -hmm. So uh, help us understand what the strategies are, mm -hmm. how we turn the curve quickly, and right. how we get ourselves on task. Right. And so I think that we, we have long-term strategies, of course, that we talked about dismantling systems, working on belief systems. We know that's the longer-term, harder work. Um, but the, the actions that uh, Sarah outlined as far as um, how we support teachers, uh, curriculum, how we ca calibrate, most importantly, what we start saying no to so that we can um, put our, all of our collective energy around this goal. Um, we actually believe, based on our community problem solving process, what's coming out of there as far as root causes, um, believe it or not, there are several things that are coming out of there that we hadn't considered and, and we hadn't designed actions around. So while those plans aren't yet laid, um, we, do, we do have an energy um, and kind of a rally cry around this work that we actually believe we'll, will yield the results. And, and I actually believe we have the resources to get it done through our shifting. Um, so our actions um, at this point are not... Um, different than what, what Sarah outlined, and we can certainly go into more detail, and we will once those action plans get formalized, um, but through uh, a new approach to math and through dismantling of, of systems, we actually believe we, we can change those outcomes. So I said I had two questions, I'm gonna add a third one. So how are we communicating this to teachers in a way that doesn't, <clears throat> put them in a position where they feel compelled to do something that maybe they shouldn't be doing, mm -hmm. but in a way that allows them to do the best they can with what they've been given, and in a way that supports our students. I mean, I love goals, and I appreciate the fact that we put these stretch goals out there for ourselves and for um, our students, mm -hmm. but I also wanna make sure that we have a sense of efficacy right. to how we go about achieving the goals. Mm -hmm. um, we've heard a lot of stories about things that have happened in other places in the country, and I don't want that to be Des Moines, but I also feel like it's important for us to share with teachers that the goals are important, mm -hmm. but the goals are not so important that we lose our integrity sure. to achieve them. Yeah. You know, um, I think one of the things we started with was, I think you said, doing the best we can with what we've been given. I think one of the first things was to acknowledge that we haven't given them what they need to get the job done. And they've been doing a really good job with exactly what they've been given. That's how I personally might interpret those grades going up over time, is that teachers are getting better at exactly what we've asked them to do. We just haven't asked them to do the whole thing. Um, and so acknowledging that then, number two, um, that they can't design all of that on their own. Not because they don't have the capacity, but because they have to build the expectations and the relationships, make sure that kids are connected to the math and what we can do, which actually is a pretty um, 
bold move that we haven't done before is also provide them with the inputs, with the curriculum that, that not just us, but that um, another, a number of external um, review boards have said meets, uh, not just addresses, but meets the demands of the Common Core. And we need to build teachers' confidence in that so that they can rely on that and us to do that. Those are two pretty radical shifts that maybe on the surface feel like just a curriculum approach, but that's Major very shift. new for teachers mm -hmm. and for leaders to be able to know and be confident and support it and um, not just assume that all of that learning has to live just at the teachers, but that we need everybody in those buildings to understand the math goal and that it's not just owned by the math teachers and how we bring that ownership around the table. Well, that's also why we continue to lift up MAP as, as kind of our check, because if, if our grades are skyrocketing and MAP scores are not changing, then we do have to question the fidelity mm -hmm. of, of our grading system. What can we do to help? I ask that we, is, yeah, it's my favorite. Um, <laughs> I think the board goals for us, giving us this focus, um, has given also us some incredible freedom to hone in on what our community has lifted up as important. Um, and the more that you stay focused on those things, um, the more we can stay focused on those things and they don't become stretch goals. They allow us to focus our energies and efforts and resources. Um, and I've said this before, I think what this also does, staying focused on this goal, um, allows us to conquer some mountains um, that will keep us moving down the mountain range. It's not just Everest and we're done. Um, if we solve some of these problems here, when we solve these problems here that right now are just about math, um, we can address other systemic concerns about how kids get access to courses, um, how we do scheduling, um, how we provide learning for teachers, and that'll allow us to um, move that influence and what we've learned there with our community into science and social studies. And so um, it's opened the door as long as we stay focused for now. And the other thing I might add, and I say this to any group that will listen, um, we're really good at, at identifying what, what we're going to do. I think we need to get better at, at identifying what we're going to stop doing in service of these goals. And so any opportunity that the board has to block things that are potentially causing distractions, that's what we need, just as our schools need us to do that for them. Um, so we got to continue to clear the plate to allow them to, to keep the main thing the main thing. Um, so that they can do the work. It's, it's not a lack of desire, it's not a lack of urgency, it's actually, in some cases, not even always a lack of resources. It's a lack of focus. Um, so that's what, that's what we need from you. Other board? I just want to just get get a chance because I had asked a bunch of questions. And I don't think since Tom wasn't feeling well, I don't think he got a chance to send those out to the board. Um, oh. And and one of those mm -hmm. was um, I had asked about some of the courses that students weren't taking, and I think we've addressed um, a little bit of that. Yeah, we've got um, that here. Yeah, in addition to. Um, you're doing some problem solving and some with with our community, and and you kind of highlighted some of that at a at a kind of big level. But for for those who you know maybe haven't been at this table quite as long, mm -hmm. can you just real quick kind of walk us through sure. how you got to some of that? And also, when you say root cause analysis, I'm seeing some words that to me, because I'm not in this every day, don't feel incredibly specific. Okay. So can you break that down yeah. for me a little bit more? So. Um, one of the biggest approaches um, that has been different this year, and this is one of those you're kind of like, duh, why didn't why didn't we do this before? Um, in, in every every district, every job I've ever been in, we always start the year with these elaborate action plans, and we all talk about what needs to be done, and and it's certainly based on um, what we think is best. Um, the approach that's different this year is once the board set the goals. One of our next major steps was if we knew what to do, we'd be getting it done. So we need to expand our perspective, bring more people to the table to try to figure out why aren't we getting it done? What is preventing us um, from, from making the real progress that we know we can make? So we engaged in a really formal, um, structured problem solving process for each goal area. And we brought in community, we brought in um, parents, we brought in students, we brought in teachers and, and admin. 
and and together through this process we're 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 digging down deep into tell us what you think what are we missing what have we not considered from that we uh, lifted up some potential root causes we're calling them as to why we're not getting the results that we want and then for each root cause before we jump into what are we going to do about it how are we going to fix it we have to verify it and so we've been going through a process of verification um, most recently and in, in this next week's meeting we're going to bring those results back um, to say okay we thought it was this do we actually have evidence that verifies that we're right before we engage in a whole year of planning a response to that. And so um, those things that we're lifting up have actually come out of that process to say, um, this is what you're missing, this is what hasn't been in place, and we're now saying, yes, that is verified, or no, it's not. And, and interestingly, or maybe not surprisingly, um, it's aligned to nationally what's coming up. And our, and our community in this process has lifted up things that have been also confirmed and verified nationally, and we didn't even share that data with them. Um, so we're feeling pretty confident in the stuff that's lifting up. Um, and so I guess, Terry, to circle back to your question of like what's different, our approach to, to designing our response is dramatically different. So What's the next step with the with the community problem solving mm -hmm. group? Because mm -hmm. so you're working on action plans currently, or next. So steps? we're at the phase now where we're bringing back the verified plans, um, and then from that they will kick it to a task force of district um, personnel who have the content knowledge and, and the expertise to then take those and and put together an action plan um, that we will then bring back to that group for feedback, but we're not going to ask our community members to design, you know, a detailed action plan. So in combination of those plans, um, it will start to resemble a more, you know, long-term strategic plan. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great. And, and I also just wanted to just reiterate some of the things that, that Terry had said. I, I understand and see teacher pressure every day where I work and I hear it from the teachers in this district when I, when I talk to them that, I don't think there's a teacher in our district who doesn't have the best intentions right. and doesn't have our kids' best interest at heart. But I do know that the focus and just the time to get the work done. Mm -hmm. So I know that there are things that you had mentioned, you know, asking the board to help block some of those things that, you know, like I think about this literally as like a pass blocker, right? I don't watch a lot of football, so that might not be the actual position, <laughs> right? I but wouldn't know either. <laughs> but it's my job to make sure the teachers can actually catch the ball, exactly, right? So I think that's another thing where I think the board maybe needs to be in very close communication mm -hmm. with Dr. Ahart, with his team, to make sure that we're very, very clear on what are those things that we should not be pursuing right now, yes, and what are those things that you know, we just need to stick a pin in maybe mm -hmm. until so that we can focus on this. So, so that's, I guess, when we say like, what can we do? If there are very specific things, um, you know, please, if you're identifying things, encourage Dr. Hart to let the board know Absolutely. of what those things are because we set these goals for a reason. And I think we're, I am incredibly focused and I've been saying now for months, even, you know, before we brought new board members on, like, this is our focus, this is what we're doing, and this mm -hmm. is the work that matters. Yep. And so please be specific with, uh, with us if there are specific you know, things like that. And I don't want to put you on the spot and say, what is that thing today? Mm -hmm. But if right. there are those things in the future, please, mm -hmm. please do let us know. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that I have anything else. Board members, did anything rise up for you? Okay, great. Well, um, may I have a motion and a second to approve item E1? There is not an evaluation because it's, I think it's because it's a first, it's a baseline. So I think we just need to have to, we just need to accept it. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. That like, yep, we received it, so. Mm -hmm. Second. All right, we have a, and I think I was supposed to do this before we started our conversation, but that's okay. We'll do it backwards. So we have a motion by Cody and a second by uh, Sawyer to accept our baseline monitoring report. Um, please vote. Yes. Thanks, Heather. I'm sorry, Heather, you didn't have questions before we did that, did you? I was hoping you would pipe up if you did. No, I think you guys covered everything. It was great. Thanks. Okay. All right, we have no information um, only items this evening. So next on the agenda, we have items of privilege. I just um, have one, uh, a couple quick notes. And the first is that 
I think it is fantastic anytime we get to hear students at this board table. And so I would encourage any students about, you know, you know, telling us anything that's going on in your school. I'd love to hear about, you know, more of the great things and programming and opportunities that students are getting access to across this district. So if teachers know of students that would be interested in coming and telling the board about some of that work, I would love to hear more about it. My second note is that caucuses are happening across our district. Um, Monday, February 3rd, and I'm so excited to welcome the community into our school buildings, and I look really for, I look forward to taking part. Yes, yes, I look forward to, yep, that's, that's my next bullet point, Terry. Um, I look forward to being part um, of this historic event, and I also want to say that the initial guidelines, I think, that were shared um, with many of our volunteers across Polk County um, were incorrect. Um, when I talked with uh, Dr. Ahart, he said what often happens is chairs get delivered to sites for events, and because of the scale of this, that cannot happen. However, the tables and chairs and all of the things that are in the school building where these events are taking place that are currently in that building um, can be used. And if anyone has further questions um, on that, I'm sure that uh, Bill Good would be more than happy to you know, direct you in the, in the correct uh, direction. Do any board members have any comments to share before? Okay, Assistant Superintendent, sure. Yes, uh, we just want to thank our students, staff, and families for staying safe through our recent bout of challenging weather. And thank you for your patience as we do our best to predict the increasingly unpredictable weather and make decisions about delays and cancellations in the interest of our students, our staff, and our family safety. Uh, on a last note there, we do not yet have a defined timeline for a board vote on the community stadium proposal. However, in a meeting last week, the board and superintendent agreed in principle to investigate avenues to make additional investments in our outdoor athletic facilities. After some further analysis of both save revenue moving forward and save and pebble projects already in our upcoming facilities plans, next month the superintendent will be bringing to the board a proposal for greater community involvement and in identifying the best opportunities for further investment in our athletic facilities, including the community stadium. Okay, so great. Um, so without any further business items, our meeting is adjourned.